and symptoms such as dizziness, chest pain or dyspnea, dyspnea is breathlessness, are associated or interpreted as indications of serious disease and therefore increase hyperventilation. So here we're back to the fat file syndrome. Individuals are feeling dizzy, they've got chest pains, and of course <coughs> the chest pain is seldom related to their breathing, they may think they're having a heart attack. Dyspnea, they're breathless, they're sitting down in their breathlessness. They don't know what's happening and they think they're really getting sick. And this is feeding back into their hyperventilation. So the symptoms of hypocapnia and additional symptoms such as chest pain, palpitations, breathlessness, disorientation and anxiety. It was Kerr who discovered this in 1937. He was able to produce these symptoms by having patients hyperventilate. So he came up with the hyperventilation provocation test, 1937. And he would have his patients breathe heavy to bring on their symptoms. And then the patient was understanding that it's my breathing that's causing my symptoms rather than a serious disease. Howell, 1990, found that individuals vary widely in their reactions to the effects of hypercapnia and that individuals with rapid onset of symptoms in response to hypercapnia had the largest numbers of classic hyperventilation symptoms. In other words, some people have a stronger predisposition to hyperventilation and that their changes happen quite rapidly in the body and they tend to have more symptoms related to hyperventilation than other people who are going around heavy breathing and it seems as if there's nothing wrong. But I think that catches up with them too. I don't think you can breathe a volume of air of two to three times more than required for 20, 30, 40, 50 years um, without it catching up on you. Because when we take into account that hyperventilation, it's affecting us all individually, but it's also affecting any organ or system to different degrees. So some people get symptoms relatively quickly, and some people get symptoms after maybe 10, 20, 30 years of hyperventilating. Panic disorder, a condition with complex psychophysiological change it causes, increases the predisposition to hyperventilation in many sufferers. So the person with panic disorder is already heavy breathing. They're sitting down at rest, they're heavy breathing. And then they get into their car. And as they get into their car, they're faced with traffic and stress. And the increased stress increases their breathing and sends them over the edge. So the heavier they breathe, loss of carbon dioxide, reduced blood flow to the brain, the brain is sensing there's insufficient oxygen, gets excited, stimulates breathing, gets rid of more carbon dioxide, and the person now is in a state of panic. It's feeding into itself. And traditionally, you'll have heard of the brown paper bag being used to calm the individual down. So the individual isn't told to take big breaths. The individual is given a paper bag to retain the carbon dioxide to open up the blood vessels to <laughs> allow better oxygen or improved oxygen to the brain. And some studies have shown that panic disorder patients generally have more respiratory symptoms and more hypercapnia than other types of anxiety because I suppose panic is directly related to breathing. Breathing is getting quick. And at the very least, they're going to feel breathless. Whereas a person with a lot of taut activity might not necessarily feel that. They don't go into the state from a respiratory point of view. Individuals, so basically hyperventilation. Individuals with chronic hyperventilation, they appear to have a low set point for CO2, resulting in persistently low CO2 levels. So their body habituates. The respiratory center, the central chemoreceptors habituate to have a poor tolerance of carbon dioxide or a strong response to carbon dioxide. And as soon as carbon dioxide accumulates in the blood, pH changes and the brain stimulates breathing to get rid of the excess. But the problem is that the brain is interpreting the level at a low point. Does that make sense? And that our breathing is too heavy to keep on getting rid of it. People with anxiety and panic disorder show beneficial response to catenometry and other breathing. So there is a number of researchers who have looked at anxiety and panic and seen that their patients respond quite well to it. More recent studies have shown that sensitization to CO2 happens more readily in anxious individuals and that sensations of air hunger occur at lower CO2 levels. So this is back to the hyperventilation and anxiety, the link. 
Hypocapnia induced by hyperventilation has powerful effects on neuronal excitability. So a number of researchers supporting that. It has also direct effects on neuronal membrane and on the production of neurotransmitters. So it has effect on the, the brain. But there is questions about carbon dioxide and the effect of hyperventilation. So some theorists are saying that hyperventilation causing low CO2 and respiratory alkalosis is contributing to anxiety, but others are saying it doesn't. So there's still a little bit of debate about carbon dioxide and its effect. So there's uncertainty about the boundaries of hyperventilation syndrome and doubts about its existence, largely because of the lack of correlation between symptoms and PCO2. Patients could have low carbon dioxide but no symptoms, while other people <coughs> could have relatively normal carbon dioxide but still exhibit the symptoms of hyperventilation. And this is possibly down to how it is measured. How do you measure end tidal CO2? Some people will take long breaths, so the gas is coming from the, the blood into the lungs and it will show a higher level of CO2. And others may get anxious and they pant. And then there's an exchange of dead space. And there's reduced levels of carbon dioxide coming into the chamber. Any time a machine is put onto you, you're going to try and beat the machine. Any time you put a mask on your face and you know that the mask is measuring your breathing, you're going to try and beat the mask. That's reality, you know, because you're trying to determine, well, what is this measuring? And I'm going to do the best that I can. And how you interpret it, it may not be necessarily correct. So Howell measured PCO2 levels in 31 patients with disproportionate breathlessness and other symptoms of hyperventilation. And he found that they had mostly normal levels of carbon dioxide. In some individuals, there may be normal or slightly reduced levels of CO2 at rest. And the exaggerated tendency to hyperventilate is only demonstrated in response to our anticipation of, phys of psychological or physiological challenge, such as stress. So there's other theories that are showing that it's the irregular and erratic breathing that's causing fluctuations in the blood gases that's causing the, the anxiety, and not necessarily the low carbon dioxide itself. So this study, 399 symptomatic hyperventilators were compared with 347 normals. And there was no difference between end tidal CO2 between both groups. Hardunk and Bumer concluded that end tidal CO2 levels were not significantly different in symptomatic or normal controls when measured in the laboratory. But I wouldn't be concerned about that because there's enough evidence showing that hyperventilation itself is contributing to symptoms. And there's enough evidence showing that the effects of dysfunctional breathing is contributing to symptoms. And we can look at that. So regardless of the measurements, but if you're making a presentation, don't necessarily rely on the whole CO2 argument because it could be thrown out. Keep it open. We don't know what's happening. All we know is that if an individual comes into me and they're sighing or comes into you, they're sighing, they have their mouth open, their upper chest breathing, you can help them. And the individual doesn't mind, is it CO2? Is it not CO2? They don't mind because we can get results without having that information. 